listening to the 10 Questions with the Musical Mind podcast with your host, Peter Harris. Hey everyone, welcome back to 10 Questions with the Musical Mind. Peter Harris here. This week we are going to welcome on board veteran drummer Brian Tishy. Brian, of course, has been a drummer for tons of legendary acts, including Whitesnake, Billy Idol, Foreigner, Ozzy Osbourne, Sass Jordan, you name it. He's been in a ton of bands, both touring and recording. And now it's his turn to start his own project, so he has the forthcoming band Silverthorn getting ready to head out of the gates. He has already posted some snippets on social media, and the stuff sounds great. Um, so Brian and I get together, and we're talking about you know, his songwriting, how he approaches new projects, getting together with everybody, and getting their musical groove together, and even some interesting theories on snare sound and how Eddie Van Halen decided to stripe his first guitar. So it's an interesting topic. We go off the rails a little bit there, but I think you'll enjoy this. So let's join Brian Tishy now. Pete? Hey, Brian. How are you? Good. How are you today? Good. How are things going in Japan? <clears throat> oh, it's cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's all going, it's going, uh, you know, going totally fine. And uh, been here for a while. It's a total of almost four months here, nonstop. You know, wow. so uh, never done uh, anything tour wise, being away from home this long. So I wasn't sure how I'd feel like halfway through after a couple months. But you know, we're pretty busy, but we have time off in between. So. You know, we have uh, these uh, apartments we keep in Tokyo that uh, we always come back to the same, you know, the same exact apartment. So it's kind of your place the whole time, which That's makes cool. really makes it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I imagine touring stateside, it's you know, people are like, oh, you get to travel country. Like, no, you get to stay in identical Ramada inns in every state. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it does, definitely makes a difference when you're away from home. At least you have a have your own place you always come back to with all your stuff in it you know yeah that's pretty nice um so i want to touch base first off you got uh, tear the sky wide open due out soon right yeah i think uh, august 12th is when the single comes out so that's not too far away and we just got the uh video edited the final video so that's ready to go and i think we're figuring out today if we release it a little bit before the single is uh, released or put it all out the same same day so we're, we're figuring that out today gotcha gotcha and I should uh, for our listeners out there who aren't already aware I should mention that we're talking about his new project Silverthorn and yep. how, how did this get all get together what was the genesis of the project how did you get everybody together uh, yeah that's uh, being that this is a, a brand new band and uh, nobody knows about it, and nobody knows, you know, everything's unknown and brand new. Um, it's it's an interesting story that eventually, when, you know, we are, you know, established and out there and people are aware of us, the story, story will fade away, but now that it's the beginning, it's a, it's, it is pretty, pretty darn interesting because I've never um, been involved with uh, something that ends up like this. I've never been in this type of situation. So anyhow, I'll uh, try to not be too long winded about it. But uh, a, a few years ago, I was working on a project, a completely new project with the uh, the guys from Stone Temple Pilots, Robert and Dean DeLeo, the, mm -hmm. the brothers, the, the guitarist and bass player. Right. We had been friends for a while and they, at STP, Stone Temple Pilots, weren't um, active at the time. You know, they, they were, of course, going to ultimately try and find a singer, right. but they weren't sure if that would happen because it's a tall order. And I guess they had tried a lot, tried to find the right guy, and, and uh, it just wasn't happening at the moment. So we had music we recorded, and we were also talking about, but we had to find a singer. We had, you know, the three of us with no singing. So... Uh, they, they were trying to do two things at once. Hopefully, you know, in their mind, if they, it would be great if they found a STP singer. But it, it, but if we came across a guy that worked for what we were doing, that that would be uh, awesome as well. So uh, they they held some auditions uh, for, for STP and contacted me the you know the day after these auditions and said, "Man, check this out. I think we found our guy." They played me a sent me a little 
recording of one of the singers and he just had an amazing voice but it was its own style and not really maybe something you'd associate with an stp style mm -hmm. vocal you know what i mean so sure. yeah could he sing the stuff yes but he you know could he sing stp yes but he just had a lot more going on and they wanted to use him for our project his, his name was pete pete shoulder so they uh, they asked Pete if he wanted to get involved with what we were doing. So he said, yeah. And we basically soon after that, a few months later, made a record, uh, which I think at the time all of us thought, <clears throat> this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this record and then, you know, get a deal, get it together and put it out the next year and become a, a real band. You know, um, that's why we're all putting the time in to make this record, you know. Well, time went on and ultimately they did find uh, a new singer for STP and made the decision to move forward with 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 STP, so that would now be about two years ago. Right. Uh, so of course we were bummed, and you know it was talked about like okay down the road we'll do this, but you know we we understood STP's their sure. their baby, it's their their life's work which they've been very successful with, and uh, you know I I don't have that so. I can only imagine, you know, what it feels like to, you know, have decades go by and, and have a new opportunity for your this band that you created a long time ago to, to continue. Sure. Uh, and, and there's a guarantee there. You know what I mean? There's success there. There's hits. There's fans waiting. So it's kind of, you know, there's a certain amount of stuff built into that project already that's going to work, you know. Um, with us, it would have been a brand new thing and maybe a lot more chances taken. So so for them, it, it, it made sense to, to move forward with, with STP. Anyhow, like I said, that was uh, when they told us, that was a couple years ago. So Pete and I talked a little while after that and I said, why don't you, Pete's from, uh, from England, so why don't you come out to my, my studio and hang out for a bit and, and we'll uh, write and record. And, which we did, and it went great. You know, and I, and I have to add in there that I didn't know much about Pete uh, outside of him being an amazing singer. And I knew, you know, he played guitar in the studio, played some acoustic guitar, and he sounded great. So okay, I, that's that's what I knew. And to go back even further, when I was in White Snake in 2011, Pete was in a band called The Union, and they mm -hmm. had opened up for White Snake. We didn't really hang out. We met, but we didn't really hang much. You know, our schedules are different on the road and all that. But I do remember going into the venues and, you know, I'd hear them opening up and I was like, man, that singer's killer, you know, but it was just like a little note in the back of my head, but I didn't, you know, think much of it in the middle of a White Snake tour. You sure. Know? So it was interesting that we came together again years later and ended up being in a band together. So, uh, yeah, the more, the more I got to know Pete and when he came out and we wrote and recorded, I'm like, man, he's not just a great singer. He's, he's plays keyboards, he, you know, piano and, uh, and he's a great electric guitar player. You know, this isn't just, it's not just like a strummy acoustic guy. <laughs> right. It's a great singer. You know, he's playing leads. He's, he's got great vibrato. You know what I mean? He can play, you know, you know, rock guitar, you know, it's it, not just a folky, rock, uh, folky guitar player or something right. like that. So anyways, yeah, we, and, and we knew that we were kind of, uh, cut from the same cloth as far as what we grew up on and what we liked in bands and, our, you know, our whole attitude towards what, you know, interest, interested us and, and excited us about what a, what an original band and music would be. So we hit it off and that was that. And last year sort of came and went with this music we wrote and we had some, some newer manager guys that we uh, worked with a little bit, but they, they just, just didn't have it together enough to, to keep it, keep it rolling as managers. They kind of had to go back to their other projects or, you know, their other jobs, you know, it was just a, something that didn't work out. So this year, I got in touch with uh, Mark Alexander Erber, who is the uh, founder of Golden Robot Records, and mm -hmm. he had written me about, through a mutual friend, about something completely different. But in his email, he was like, hey, hey, this is Mark, I have Golden Robot Records, you know, and, you know, we have King's X and Skid Row and John Sykes. And, They've got some good um, stuff going on, yeah. Yeah, so, so I was like, oh, wow, I'm friends with all those guys, and I wrote back, hey, you know, but we were talking about this, he was writing me about this, this Bonzo Bash uh, celebration event I have at, at NAMM shows. He was, it was, the email was about that. So I wrote back, said, uh, oh, hey, man, you know, cool. I, I will, I have a new band, you know, a hard rock band, whatever. And he's like, oh, cool, send me, the, send me some stuff. And that, that was really it. He heard it and said, let's talk, let's, let's make this happen. 
Cool. And that was uh, earlier this year. So, so we just, you know, of course these things take a while. You know, it takes months to get all the, you know, you get contracts and to organize the schedule and blah blah blah. And then I knew I was going to be in Japan for the summer, so it kind of made sense. Okay, we can take our time here. We don't want to get this. We don't want to jump into this too quickly. And you're in Japan, so so it gave us the summer to sort really really uh, get everything organized. You know, before I came out to Japan here, and uh, we made we did some you know. Uh, Photo sessions and videos and all that got got a lot of got the tools that we needed prepared and to, so we could get it together in the summer. And w- within all this, um, my my buddy Daniel Spree, who's the, the, our our bass player, he he got involved. You know, so um, it was you know back then I, I sent him the songs and told him what we were doing and 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 there you go. You know, so so we you know so. You know, it's a trio power trio thing. Yeah, the snippet I've heard so far sounds great. Um, so I'm looking Thank forward you. to that definitely. Uh, you know, y- you've played with so many people. Um, is there any one situation that you recall being like pushing out of your envelope or out of your comfort zone that kind of like, ooh, I've got a, this is not my usual gig that comes to mind? Uh, <laughs> fortunately and, and unfortunately, no, because those situations will, you know, You'll have to see yourself rising up to the occasion, right? Right. You know, but but uh, no. The only fortunately, I've been involved in you know stuff that was within what I can handle. I guess you know, it's more about the workload. It's more about like how much time do you have to prepare something, or uh, you know, how many things are you doing at once? Yeah, you do you a know, lot. That, yeah. <laughs> but 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 no, like for the most part. Uh, I've I don't have it's I haven't been involved in something where where I was like overwhelmed to the point where I couldn't handle it or anything like that. No. Right. I just meant more like yeah like not like you couldn't handle it. Something like oh I don't really love this reggae type beat or you know that kind of thing. I don't you know but now when you're writing songs when you've written a lot of songs uh, you co-wrote a lot with Billy Idol and, and et cetera and the list goes on and on. Um, where do you usually start? Because you play guitar also, and I've seen you playing some uh, Randy Rhodes stuff. You're you're a heck of a player on guitar also. Where do you usually start for you? Um, is it a, a beat? Is it a, a vague idea of a mood, a chord progression? What's usually the genesis for you? I mean, usually it's guitar, mm-hmm. yeah, whether it's you know acoustic or electric, and and I would say most of the time. And it, it became, and probably because I'm such a fan of the big riff, you know, you, sure. you you come up with something that catches your ear, like, oh, that's not, you know, man, for every thousand riffs you play on a guitar, you know, you might, you know, one of them might just pop out, like, wow, that's something to think about, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and and I and I like that the most because, uh, man, that's you know, that's just such a huge part of rock and roll, and at least what I love about it, you know, it's just a huge guitar riff that sets up a song. Um, hopefully the rest of the song doesn't suck, because, <clears throat> you know, if you if you, you had your Smoke on the Water or Cat Scratch Fever riff or whatever, or ain't talking about love, but but then the song comes in and the vocalist isn't that great and the chorus sucks, and, you know, <laughs> right. and, you know, well then whatever about the riff, but, but um, or, you know, or the rest of the song parts aren't happening, you know, the riff is only gonna go so far. Uh, that's that's probably where I get most excited. I, I just you know, just because and because it's, it you know it's just the thought of you know when you when you hit a riff in front of an audience or, or a listener hears it for the first time it just it pretty much it just you know, it can in. cause instant excitement you know right. it's just you know when you have when you have some a good powerful riff but uh, but other times you might have a phrase you might have a a, a vocal phrase or or. A, a, or even just a, a little melody or, or a couple chords that somehow you just something works around you know whether it's a guitar melody on top of and and you can go off of that but but yeah that that's that's pretty much it it's occasionally there might be a drum beat here and there but here or there but uh i, I usually if, if there's songwriting going on i'm probably on a guitar yeah i mean that makes sense but also i'm not i've never played drums and I wonder, like, for somebody like you or any drummer, when you have to go to a, a gig and you're sitting in or whatever and you have to play backline, like house equipment, um, how big of an adjustment is that for drummers? Like, if you're, like, sitting down a kit that's not yours, you're like, oh, I'm not used to not having this floor tom or that kind of thing. Is that a big adjustment or is that pretty easy to just take in stride? 
you just have to deal with it and the more you, you the more you have those experiences the easier it gets because there's you, you don't know what you're getting into you don't know the way the, the how high the snare drum is or the, how the pedal's going to feel or where the cymbals are angled so you have to just sit down and go I'm a drummer and these are drums you know right. just, you can't look at it like anything else but that whereas when you're on a tour and you have a, a drum tech you know who's there setting your stuff up and you're you know it's going to be dialed in then your 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 mind changes a bit your your mind changes too I can I play this exactly knowing where everything is and exactly what I'm going to do and you're pretty much rehearsed and you, you know you have your stuff down but if you're just going into a club and sitting on somebody's kit there's a, a whole different you just you just look at it differently and you accept it you know so and and it's not the same you know when you're you know doing a jam in a club on somebody's drums as compared to uh right you know, as, as compared to being on your kid on a tour that's you know a rehearsed band on the road you know so some people you, you know at the end of the day with all that stuff if you're going to get up and play wh whether it's your kid or not whether you're totally comfortable or not no, you, you just can't make excuses so you you have to sort of be you know just be a drummer and play drums you know and okay i can't do all my flashy little tricks and i can't do my little my speedy fills because i'm, I'm well, because I'm not comfortable in this kit. Okay, well, just, just make sure you play the groove. Make sure you can just sit there. And, I, I mean, I, God, I remember so many times I sit down and I go, ah, snare drum's angled, weird, it's low. Okay, the main thing is find your two and four. Just find that place where the two and four is going to be powerful. That's the first thing. All the other stuff doesn't matter. Just, you know, just sit there and get your groove together. And, wow. uh, and don't worry so much about the other stuff, you know. Yeah, and I think it's it probably it bears mentioning a lot of times a lot of the audience – won't rec they'll recognize the, if the groove is not good, but they're not going to be like, oh, he didn't do a roto tom fill. I mean, they're not. Most non musicians are not thinking about that. Yeah, it, and I got to tell you on this subject, this reminds me. I'm thinking like, where do I have? Because whenever you get asked questions, you can sort of answer generally. You know, you can I can give you a, a pretty nice overview of of an answer. But I'm thinking that I know I have lots of experiences where I've been in. Yeah. situations where I'm totally unco uncomfortable and probably the one that stands out the most because it is a pretty cool story because I this is another thing I'd never done until that day um <clears throat> it was well geez it was 20 years ago it was I was in Foreigner and we were touring with Journey mm -hmm. and uh the Journey drummer uh, this is 1999 was uh, my, my buddy Dean Castronova yeah and you know I was a fan of Dean's I sure. was aware of his kick-ass drumming and all that stuff but we didn't meet until until that tour so uh, every night, like clockwork, we'd go on on time, do our set, they'd play. We'd, we'd always hear a chunk of their set before we before we left the, the venue and you know got back on the road. But uh, um, uh, one night, we start, we're, we're, we're all ready to go on stage, and, and we're, a couple minutes go by. You know, we're supposed to be on. What's up? And then five, ten minutes go by. What? There's Something's weird here. You know, well, it ends up Dean hurt himself, and oh. he wasn't going to be able to play the show. So... Everybody, you know, in Foreigner Journey's management are trying to figure out what are we going to do here if Journey can't play, you know, because, the, you know, now you have to make up the show or the fans aren't going to be happy. Uh, and it, and this, if they do happen to do the show and we go late, you're going into curfew time, which gets very expensive, right? Uh -huh. So they're figuring this all out. They come up to me and go, Brian, can you do the Journey show tonight? And I'm like, so this is in Reno, like 17,000 people, right? And we just played LA the night before and I was already joking around with the band because, you know, I guess we stayed up late and, you know, partied and all that stuff. Of course. And I was, oh, guys, I can't play the show tonight. I'm, <laughs> I'm two hours of sleep. I'm burned. You know? So I was already kind of burnt. I'm, of course, it wasn't going to matter. I was still going to do the show. But <laughs> they go, yeah, can you do it? And I, I'm thinking, okay, well, I know a bunch of Journey songs and I've heard a bunch of their set, you know, when we were, when we finish and they start playing. But, man, just to get on stage and do that, like, no... Right. No preparation, talk. like <laughs> fucking hey man, that's 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 you know that's a lot of pressure. That is pressure. So, yeah, so this is literally we're we're supposed to be on stage playing foreigner music as we speak. So I say yes, then they go, they go, uh, okay, which what kit do you want to use? Your kit or Dean's? And I'm like, well, I'd rather use mine, but I don't. That's just going to draw way too much attention to the right. the oddness of ha having a foreigner logo on a on a journey stage like i don't that mean everybody's gonna be staring at the drummer even more like what's going on here right. so i said I'll, I'll play dean's kit 
you know and now i had a single kit kind of bottom set up the smaller kit dean had double bass bunch of toms tons of cymbals you know and i'd never played his kit i watched him seen it you know walked by his kit but i'd never sit down sat down and played his kit so i do the the foreigner show i get off stage and they're literally rushing me into their backstage come on come on get here they're talking down the set list i have a piece of paper and i'm trying to make notes like okay this song you know this one starts like a song i didn't know it has the hits like that i'm trying to write these hits down like this is not gonna work the manager's like guys we got to do this so they're like oh, okay we'll cut this song we'll cut that song we can do this okay you know stone in love all right you, you know you know uh separate ways yeah okay you're gonna be playing to a click track the click tracks fed to you from Jonathan Kane. You hear Jonathan's voice pre-recorded saying the title of the song and counting you in, and you count the band in. So I'm like, okay, this <laughs> this is totally like a lot, like just this is being told to me as the manager is you know saying get on stage. So, um, anyways, the the funny end of that little you know, that little meeting before we hit the stage is that I think Neil says, okay, we'll we'll cut. Don't stop believing. I go, I go, no, no, no. Don't cut that one. I go, I learned how to play the drum part from Steve Smith's instructional video. Right. <laughs> Keep that one in there, man. Right. So, all right, cool, cool. So we, we go on stage, and and the first thing I hear is uh, just Jonathan Cain's pre recorded voice going, you know, separate ways. One, two. And I click the band in, right? And, and we're off. And, okay, that song, I hear him do it every night. I know the song. And, and then in the middle, there's a, a big Steve Smith bill in one of the breaks where he goes like, gah, 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 yeah, gah, gah, you know, well, Dean did it a little differently in using a, his, his double kicks and I'd seen him do it. So I'm like, okay, I'll just do what he does. Like I won't, I'll do it the way I watched Dean do it. Um, and that was the first time I touched his bass drum pedals at the same time and mine were tight and his were loose. So I like almost fell over the pedals the way oh, I was yeah. just not prepared to be balanced. And I totally rushed the fill, played over the click, and it was to me it was a, an uncomfortable train wreck. Like right. that little that one bar of d drum fill. You know, it, it it didn't screw the band up. I just ended early and felt like way off balance with the whole thing. But that was a quick mental a mental note. Okay, Dean's pedals are way looser than mine. I gotta adjust right. that. But any you know Anyways, it ended up, you know, I did the show and, and it went okay. There was there were definitely a couple a couple train wrecks. But man, if there was ever a time you had to That's high pressure. You had to sit there and say, Okay, uh, nobody out in the audience knows that there was no preparation time. Nobody knows the details. We're not getting into this on stage. We're doing a journey rock show, you know? And all you can do is is do your best and 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 uh hopefully come come across with a little bit of confidence right. you know and uh yeah so that was still <clears throat> uh there i don't think i've ever had any kind of pressure like that because even if they said on a day off hey brian dean hurt himself can you play tomorrow if you gave me that just that one night and day you know what i mean right. i'd say even if you called me at 10 in the morning and say we're playing tonight you know and i had the afternoon a whole huge, huge difference. Sure. Huge difference. You could mentally wrap yourself around it and run through the set list and be like, okay, here's the spots I need to familiarize myself with. Yeah, that's. But you know, what a lot of people don't know is that if the singer had gotten sick, um, Dean could have easily filled in for the singer. He has a tremendous voice. Uh, yeah, and I, and back then I heard rumors. I heard, you know, you got to hear Dean sing at sound checks, and we were never there when they were sound checking. He's, he's an amazing singer. I was like, that's cool, you know. It, but it wasn't until <clears throat> I, I might have heard it on heard him on YouTube or something. But we, but Foreigner, I think I don't know, it was Billy Idol. We did a show, a radio show with Journey, and I was on the side watching. And they went into man, what whatever it was, faithfully or yeah, but no, sorry. And, and, but when he started singing, I mean, he, it was I think this was 2006. And I was like, that was one of the, the most ass kicking things I had witnessed that whole year was G Gene singing and, and not just singing and playing drums you know if you're a drummer I know I think it looks to the others that, like difficult like how do you sing and play but um, it, I guess it depends on the drum parts but if you're just keeping time it's kind of like dancing and singing you know for the most part but just his voice and his tone and his power and, and being like you know virtually unknown as a singer and, and pulling off Steve Perry was completely insane. Yeah, yeah, he's he is a he is a just 
he's just one of those guys. You know, I, I've never talked to him about like when did you, you know, did you practice singing? Is this something that, you know, I have a feeling he's just one of those guys that had a, a natural relative pitch and, and a natural ability to sing just built in like a, you know, one of, one of my daughters has that. She's just, she's just got pitch and the ability to nail notes and just get it, you know, and her tone is there without even trying. You That's know, awesome. Just, some people have that, you know, so, but yeah, he's, he's amazing. Totally yeah, he's amazing. a great singer. Who are some drummers whose snare tone you really like? Oh, um, okay. That's easy. I, I love this. We could have had a whole... Yeah, <laughs> I know. A whole conversation <clears throat> on that alone, and I would have been fine. Let's do one hour on snare tone. Oh, you could but, get me... Uh, I mean, I, yeah. if I could ever talk to him, mean, I've talked to people who've known him and stuff. I'm always like, you know, what about Bill Bruford's snare tone, like on Hell's Bells? And just like that just fascinates me. But go ahead. I'm, did you say Bill Bruford on Hell's Bells? Yeah, the song Hell's Bells off One of a Kind. Oh, oh, okay, okay. I, of course, I I went to Phil Rudd and he's, no, 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 yeah, it's a yeah, totally different, <laughs> totally different Hell's Bells. Oh no, see, but Bruford's in, okay. He's in my he's in the he's in the list, and it starts at Roundabout, and it goes to you know pretty much it's just Bruford. But I mean, for me as a kid, it was it was fragile. Mm -hmm. close to the edge and and then discipline from uh, King Chris King Crimson yeah but just just oh my that's it's just yeah man it's got it it's every it just blows me away to this day I'll just put a some a track on from discipline just to just to hear a snare real quick you know yeah. I absolutely love it so so yeah it's 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 Bonham Alex Van Halen yeah Bruford uh, Michael DeRozier from Heart mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh Okay, then then I would I would have to throw in um, Jerry Shirley from Humble Pie. I, oh, okay. I, I, it's a serious snare sound, and uh, and then I have to throw in a, a, a late seventies era Kiss for Peter Chris. There's a, there's a Kiss Alive two mm -hmm. rock and roll over half a love gun a love gun. His snare is phenomenal. If just 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 go put on. A track from Kiss Alive too. It's just an amazing, beautiful sounding snare drum. Um, so those those are my tops. And God, who am I who who am I leaving out as far as um, others? I mean, those are the guys for me right there. Sure. The, you you know, know, yeah, Bonham it, and Halen, Bruford, Shirley, uh, Peter, Chris, and and DeRozier. Yeah. There's a, a old line. Uh, it's. You may well know it, but uh, in an old interview with Eddie Van Halen, he said that people always get it wrong. He said, when I was talking about the brown sound, I was originally for, referring to Alex's snare tone. All right, okay, you're, now you're opening up another bag. Yeah. Another whole thing. <laughs> no, because I've thought, I, I eventually, and I hope to someday see if this, if my, uh, if my uh, observations of my guesses are, are, are even close to correct because yes most people just they say brown sound and they they think that's what eddie calls his sound but yeah he it was the brown sound was alice's snare sound right right yep now to go one step further and you go back well there was some point in time where eddie made this note in his head like alex has this snare sound that to me is sounds like the brown sound that's 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 Eddie, right? Right. So he made a note of this, and then you look at Alex back in the day, and what, okay, what's Alex's what Al, what is Alex doing to get his snare tone? Like, what's he doing differently? Is there anything unique about what he's doing to his snare drum? And there's there's a lot of gaffer tape involved, right? Okay. Okay. There's there's a lot of angles. Like there's you see pictures. Sometimes it's underneath the top head on the bottom of the top head. Or uh, it's on the top and it's angled in sort of random striped. One, one might look like a triangle. One might have you know five separate strips of gaffer tape, it, and it just kind of sort of co covering the head. But I don't know if there's necessarily a rhyme or reason to why it's you know you know huh. put put on that way, right? But what I'm getting at is we're looking at a snare drum head with striped with gaffer tape. Do you see where I'm going? Sure. Straight with yep. gaffer tape. Does this tie in with Eddie? Right. Go to his first black and white striped guitar. Huh. You know, it's, and it's on, and it, that's that's Come pretty on. damn interesting. And you, know, it's hard to tell. It's so frustrating because 
it, you know, it, one of my favorite musicians of all time, but Eddie's the king of the stock BS answers in interviews for the last 35 years. He gives the same responses over and over again. And you don't yeah. know, you know, what's really, you, you wonder if he even stops and thinks like, what, you know, he's like, oh, I don't know what caused me to strike the guitar. Like, does he even stop and think about it? Does he just spit out the same answer he's always said? Um, well, has, well, has he answered why he striped it? Well, has somebody asked him in some interview and he said, yeah, I don't really know why it just came to me. And so it's hard to say. Well, that's you know, what I've read. That's, that's what I've read. It's just like, that's maybe the only thing I've read. It just came to me. But I'm like, come on, wait, you can't. Right. Re- I mean, you can say that, but come on, when you, when you're, and I know he's, he was messing around with guitars and taking them apart and, and changing things. And, and he's very creative and inventive with, with everything to do with it, the look and the sound. But something like that, where there had never been that look before, right? right. There just hadn't been. Right. It, it's you, you can't really go, but I mean, okay, wasn't it, was it Buddy Guy with the polka dots, like yeah. three Randy Rhodes, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yep. so like, but that's not stripes, you know what right. I'm saying? And I, and I know like, okay, what if Paige had his painted, uh, what was it, this dragon guitar, the Telecaster, like yeah. there's, you know, stuff going on with the looks of guitars. And the thing is, that stripe design on the first black and white one, um, it it wasn't like I just slapped some stripes in there. It was like a a graphic designer did it. I mean, it was a very pleasing design. You know, it was, it was pleasing, but there is a a randomness to it. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a piece of tape cut. So it's like kind of uh, squiggly. Curved. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, you know what I mean? It's just, it's over it. But yeah, it wasn't pleasing. Yeah. Because it, it, I don't know anybody that said they didn't love the look of his striped guitars. Like it, it, I've never met anybody, you know? So, and I'm going, how, come, come on, black. And it, yeah. it wasn't until a few years ago when I was just like trying to tape up a snare drum in a similar way. And I was just like, I'm going to just mimic it and see what happens, you know, which there's more to it. I wish I wish I could say I got the Alex tone because if I did, I'd use it all the time. If like you that. ever get but, some kind of insider information from Alex or a drum tech in the industry or something, and you got to let me know on that because that's an interesting theory. No, no, I've just heard I've heard different different things, but then it all comes around to yeah, but it he's played different snares throughout his career and he still gets the same sound. So it's Alex, and I don't think he's using gaff tape now like he used to but he's still getting an insane snare sound so um but but you know his snare didn't that that color at least to, at least to me didn't come out that that what we what i associate with alex's sound didn't really come out until fair warning when you like if you put right. on the first three records i mean it's alex is awesome and there's quality there's there's qualities of it there or characteristics but that full snare drum sound it would to me didn't come out until um, you know, just right. until fair warning, and and then after that, then Diver Down. You listen to Snare on Diver Down. Oh my God, it went to the next level. Yep. Then you get to 1984, and you have Hopper T-shirt. I'll wait. Uh, oh my God, you know, Drop Dead Legs. His snare is it's, it's insane. So they 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 fit, whatever whatever. There's also something going on in the studio. They know what they're doing. Like there's you know, right. You you have a mic on a snare drum. You can EQ it. There's you know, you can compress. There's like so many things you can do to bring out. You know, sounds with in, inside the snare. Like if you, you know, tune a snare as a drummer, you're sitting, you're sitting on on top of the snare drum. Your your ears are getting that snare drum tuned how you want to hear it, right above it. You're not hearing it across the room. You're not True. hearing it with the mic underneath it, or you're not even hearing it as an overhead. You know, you're hearing it you know, with your a stereo version. You know, with your two ears a couple feet away from the snare, right above it, and that's where you that's your what judgment, you think your right. snare drum should sound like, right? Right. And then you go into the control room when somebody puts a mic on and you go, man, that's so not bringing out what the snare drum sounds like to me. And, and then there's that process of trying to figure out how to get that snare to sound the way you hear it and the way you tuned it. Well, it's like you hear your voice recorded. Alex is done. <clears throat> right. What's that? It's like hearing your voice recorded. You're used to hearing it the way it sounds in your head, not out mm-hmm. of the microphone. But the... Uh, but yeah, the now this is a random question, but I think you, you'll get it. So Alex is like drums say the beginning of push comes to shove talking about fair warning the very beginning of push comes to shove do 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 you know then he breaks into that that beat is that room echo on those two hits or is that added echo it sounds like just room ambience to me can you uh, no you're talking you're talking about dirty movies oh it is dirty movies yeah 
But I think, um, I don't think they recorded those drums in a big room. And uh, I think that's, there's some verb added on. Yeah. Added, added onto that record. Um, even when it sounds kind of dry, you know, for the most part, like it's, that's definitely not a huge reverb sound on, on that record. There's not like a, a huge verb going on, but, but there is, there is something there. And I, I think they just put some on, you know, I, and I don't know off the top of my head where, where that record was recorded, but I, I want to say I sunset sound it was in a big room. I, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. I know the first couple ones were at sunset sound, but I don't know about fair warning. Um, yeah, the uh, <clears throat> this is off topic, but I've got uh, I was interviewing somebody last year, and we we're in his studio, and he had the the master tapes from Van Halen one, and you can hear like he was putting out great things. He's like, okay, listen here, and he's listening. He showed me the the bass track from Run of the Devil. And when you isolate the bass, you can hear Alex's kit vibrating nearby because he's standing yeah, right next I, to the kit. I have that. I have that session. Okay. On, uh, Run, Run of the Devil and Pro Tools, like separate, every track separated. So that was the first one I got of that kind because uh, I have some others from Boston and Queen cool. and stuff like that. But yeah, it's amazing to, to solo up individual tracks. And yeah, you can hear the bleed. Which, yeah. You know, you can hear the, which man, it's that's a whole other thing but that we're not talking about, but you're <laughs> hearing the bleed. And when you want to, you say that, you can't say that too lightly. You're actually listening to a band recording at the same time in the same room. There might be isolation. There might be gobos and you know what are isolation you know uh, part partitions put up right you know. But they are in there playing at the same time. And you're uh, and you're which, getting like a time capsule. Like you're viewing a exact moment in history from probably late '77. It's just amazing to think about. Yeah, and and to. to just if you tell a band these days go in and do it play live we're going to record you live and then you're recording to two inch so you know it's not going to be the easiest thing uh to to be editing and punching you know what i mean we're right it's a totally different world but that's that's like worthy of a band meeting of everybody going okay guys everybody go home tonight have a think about this let's talk tomorrow see how you feel are you ready to take this on like and all you're asking the band to do is play as a band and get recorded. You know what I mean? And and uh, but that's that was the, that was the norm, man. That's how you made records. That's how you got in the studio and did it. You know. And now it's like, I mean, and I see the advantages to not doing that. I mean, there's so many, sure, you know, sensible reasons not to. But but man, it, it's, it's in my mind. I mean, it it, it sort of separates the. <laughs> the, the the you know the men from the babies man. sure like those, those and, and that while they were doing that they're creating their own groove they're creating their own sounds it was man and you put those records on and and I still to this day and I'll, I'll probably die saying this man that that, that the sixties were killer and you know there's great stuff in the eighties and nineties and all that but the seventies when when everything was just get, when technology and studio technology and live technology was right. really hitting new levels. Just, just the, just being able to be cre creative in those environments, then, yet not have this Pro Tools kind of uh, thing happening where you know you can fix one little note and right. you can edit till you know the cows come home it, it, it easily, easily, like ridiculously easily. Now uh, you didn't have that. You really had to be a great band playing in the studio, and that's what it was. You know, it starts with the drummer. That's your groove. That's your tempo, and everybody can follow along. And as long as the, you know. As long as the drummer gets his, keeps his shit together, there, you, yeah, you might be able to punch in something here and there, you know, on the other instruments. But, but if the rhythm tracks the rhythm track for the most part, right. like, like we're talking about with Van Halen. I and I, I, I absolutely love it because, and then I go, why do I love it so much? Why can't I just sit here and go, whatever, man? You know, we do it differently now, and you have more, you know, you know, options at your disposal to take advantage of. But it's like, yeah, but when you start playing and you're excited about an instrument, you get better at your instrument, you put those hours in, those ridiculous amounts of hours, and, and you're dreaming and you're listening to your favorite musicians right. and bands, and you're going, and, and, and the illusion is that, you know, I have to sound that good. And you're not knowing, you know, what goes on in a studio as a kid learning an instrument. You're not right. knowing, you don't know what goes on in, in you know, that that kind of thing that world but but you're that's what you're reaching for right so you're, you always want to be your best and and you want to be proud of what of all the time you put into your instrument so it's you know it's it's uh that's that's to me that 
still matters. It's like, it's just a sense of just self pride. Right. You know, I got in here and I played the way I played and it came out this way. It, you know, I didn't have to go in and, and copy paste or, you know, for singers, man, back in the back, yeah. it was just the norm. You're a singer, you get on TV and you sing your song and you're a great singer or you're a singer with a, a character and it sounds a certain way. And, you know, you can watch Mick Jagger sing whatever song, 10 different versions, and they might not be the same version, but it's Mick Jagger with his character. And he's just going to kill it. Right. You know, and, and, I, and I love that. I, I, I love that. I don't like that new records and live music, especially with uh, backing tracks. You know, sure. I, I've done it. I've been the drummer in those situations, playing to a click all night. And, and uh, it's one thing to say, okay, you know, play to a click because we have, you know, percussion to add to the, you know, we don't have a percussionist on tour with us, but we want percussion on this, you know, want some tambourine and bongos. Okay, fine. You know, it's, it's, it's just percussion. But if you're going to start adding background singers and, and horn sections and, and a separate rhythm guitar, uh, oh my God, you yeah. know, and, and it's just, you know, yeah, then you get, that's what, at what point do you, uh, at what point is, is, is that, does that become too much, you know? Right, at what, at what point, point is it, is it not, cheating, yeah. You know, so, so that, so it, to get back to the point, man, it's just, it, I'm, that's just me. I just like, you know, you put all your time into something and you want to be able to strut your stuff. You know, you want to be able to be and, and sit back and go, this is what I did. You know, this wasn't, I wasn't helped along the way. I wasn't, you know, somebody didn't carry me through the process. It's like, well, what'd you spend all those years practicing? You know, what were you, what were you, what were you doing? You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> You know, is, were you only looking at the pictures of being on stage with the cheering fans? I mean, you weren't listening to, you know, the, the tones and grooves of, you know, your favorite, you know, whether you're a guitar player or, 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 the, or if you're a drummer, you know, paying attention to how to make that song from top to bottom, you know, sound a groove uh, and, and, and have the same attitude, meaning, you know, how are you hitting your snare? How are you playing your hi-hat? When you do fills, how does your drum set as a whole sound? It can't have ups and downs in a way of like losing steam and momentum because you didn't think about all these things that go into your, into sort of mastering your instrument. You know? Right. And I think it's important. I think it's fun, man. I think, you know, if, if you don't want to just have to get a, like a, you know, some day job just to pay your bills and, and you actually can do it through playing music and, and being a musician, but man, that's 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 a, that's amazing in itself. So like now now you get to take the time to really refine it. And the better you are, the more confident you are. That's what I tell you know tell students when I teach, man. That you this it's not about you know the learning the most technical stuff. It's it's about just just that next level of feeling confident when you achieve one little one little thing that you didn't do the, the day before. You're gonna sit behind a kid and play with more confidence and right. you're going to be more proud of yourself you know and getting those skills down it's like i said I, i'm not a drummer but you know and i think you and i are about this close to the same age and you know when i was a teenager in the 80s i remember telling one of my best friends like you can tell like okay hearing the first couple songs by the police even if it was a simple simple beat i'd listen to it like that guy is a phenomenal drummer you know when you first start hearing Stuart copeland he didn't, it was before i ever heard him do really complex stuff but you can just tell by the swing he had i'm like this guy is great and it, it's almost a, it's it's hard for me to pin down why i can tell that but you can oh yeah yeah and, and Stuart is amazing and you know caught my ear immediately and and uh, c continue to and still does you know I, I, I love him but yeah there's he just has this little pizzazz popping out in his playing man you can hear the excitement you yeah know? that's it's, a good way to put it just, you know, yeah you can you can feel it and and <clears throat> yeah and that's that's what's great about I mean his 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 personality came through his drumming and it made the police sound a certain way whereas you might get Whatever. Let's say you had ten bands now that are influenced by the police. It, it, chances are they're going to go into a studio. The drummer's going to play to a click. He's going to be chopped and cut up and edited. They're going to auto tune vocals. Mm -hmm. They're going to oh my, all the stuff that's going to take like the life out of what that band might have on their own. Right. I, I wouldn't want to hear people screwing around Stuart Copeland's drumming, you know, at no. all. And I mean, he's solid as shit, but he's got this, uh, he's got this like 
forward momentum energy like he's it's i don't want to say push because you say oh he's the drummer's like it's rushing or something i don't mean rushing it's forward momentum excitement like he builds and gets you into part next parts of the songs with, with excitement you know like yeah. he's psyched to get there like here we go and and uh you start you start you know um getting to, uh, you know too anal in the studio man you can you can lose all that stuff and and i i would I couldn't even imagine what the the stones or the who would sound like if you took that approach i don't even want to hear it man yeah it's, you know? it's it's a dangerous situation having unlimited tracks and that kind of thing and, and having said that though you know fleetwood mac steely dan from the 70s that stuff sounds pristine and that is that does sound like there was a lot of time and focus put into the studio recordings with amazing musicians like more or less like let's say studio musicians but that's also a sound and i don't think that every one of those tracks especially in the 70s i don't think you're 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 they're playing to clicks i think you just have badass drummers with with solid time and focus in the studio and know how to play drums in the studio which is different than playing drums live you know and uh it's just, mick fleetwood man i wouldn't don't don't touch those drums on on, on rumors you know what don't, i'm saying like, don't touch the like, drums on hypnotize with bob welch singing you know what I'm yeah, talking about? It, 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 yeah, and, and, but I think it like just they made a real pristine production, you know, quality to their records back back then. You know, that sounded nothing like the Who. You know, it, it, it definitely was more radio and studio friendly, right? But sure. But man, it's what a what a sound, what a sound. But it still sounded only like Fleetwood Mac. And of course, you have you know whatever Steve, Steve Stevie Nicks's. You know her her vocal tone, her sound is already that's so much of Fleetwood Mac at the time, and as is Lindsay and stuff. But just that, just the the production of the, them in the studio it sounded it sounded nothing like so many other bands back then. But but it was still Fleetwood Mac. It wasn't like they were chopped up in the studio by a producer that had to get guest musicians in or ghost musicians to cover for what the band couldn't do or you know all that junk, man. I. I yeah, there's, there's nothing exciting about that to me. Is it, no. is, is, uh, is like the, so many rock records now sound the same, but and and the, the tones because we figure it out. You know, you can put a regular sounding drum set in a, in a studio, and and the drummer might not. Uh, he maybe he plays fine, but he, there's not. A, you know, there's just nothing maybe unique about his his playing or his sound or whatever or the drum set itself or the recording. But man, you can get that. Kit sounded amazing by the end of the of the you know the production and mixing. You know what I mean? And, and it, amazing meaning in a current way. You know, but at the end of those sessions and records, you have most of the drum sound sounding the same. Whether it's you know, and a lot of it's to do with with uh, samples and stuff. And right. just adding, oh god, man! But th like as a musician, you you plug in your guitar. Get you dial in a sound and you go that's it i love that i'm really happy with that well you want to hear that on the record just like a drummer man okay that's my snare drum those are, that's my kick drum those are my toms this is my drum set i really like the way it sounds this room is great and to not have that <laughs> to not have that scene through is, is a bummer man because yeah. that's that's going to be a part oh god I mean, oh, you know you can't i don't know at least i, I don't talk about modern recordings and production with any with the same excitement as I, as I talk about anything from the past because some of it so much of it is now done similarly with similar techniques and and tools you know to get the same sounding end result and right you know, I don't know yeah they, don't, you don't they're not forced to do the innovation like recording bottom at the bottom of a stairwell and that kind of thing they don't they don't have to because they can coax those sounds in the studio yeah, and and it still never comes out the same because they're still in the modern, they're st their heads still in the modern world of right. of technology. They're still going to approach that. Let's go for that bottom sound, man. But you're still going to approach it with a, you know, a, with a, with modern ears. You're right. not going to let certain things go because I've been there. Like people just don't want to let it go. They don't want to let what they what's current go. You know, to get back to what. When we put on an old Zeppelin record and you just trip out and you go, oh my God, well, you got to let some of the stuff that you know now go to get back there, you know? Sure. It's, and and uh, that, that's, I mean, it's it's just fun because if people, if you know, I guess, the, you know, hey, this doesn't stop record sales. It doesn't stop a great song from being a great song or anything like that. But it's just that side of it, that flavor that when you hear something come on the radio or you put something on it, it just has this overall production that 
brings you to a, a place like a, its own place. Yeah. You know, you associate feelings with with sounds, and you put that record on. You go, it puts you in, in a world that nothing else will, because of the way it sounds. Because that those guys got together and recorded sounding how they make themselves sound and it's pretty pretty much that simple you know i mean it's very the true sound like the stones and the who sounds like the who and it's not because of the producers and i'm not taking anything away from engineers and producers at all like at all but i'm saying they're capturing they're capturing amazing uh musicians playing amazing music they're capturing that and put, put it on record you know as opposed to you know, this is we got to we got to polish a turd here or something. You know, right. I'm, I'm being extreme, but I'm saying even if you have an average band that has some decent songs and they're pretty cool, you know, you can you know, producer or engineer can do do a ton of stuff with that. You know, they can get it up to the next level, and you know, especially with I guess singers nowadays. You know, and and then you go watch, you sit there and watch your big Crosby and David Bowie sing together, just like you know, you'll watch uh, God, who did I see? Little Richard and Tom Jones. Holy shit. Oh, I've just seen like, that. Oh my god, like dude, <laughs> if you if you want to be a singer and you watch that and you don't think you need to you know practice and get it, you know, bump it up, it's it's just like it's like me watching, you know, whatever, watching Buddy Rich, you know, if I don't if I don't take note of that and go, you know, oh my God, there's a lot to learn. I have I have a long way to go. You know, right and something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, when but, you get to oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just gonna say to sum it up and plug Silverthorn a little bit more. That's you know, we, you know, this it's a it's a brand new thing, and I have no idea what's gonna happen. We're just excited, and we really hope we get a shot out there to uh, you know get a shot to play and and uh, become a, a real band uh, <laughs> doing real things. But we but our approach was we we maybe would have been a little smarter and tried to play the game and got a proper producer and recorded everything in a, a modern way. But we were, were maybe too passionate and hard headed and, and and have a belief of like, you know, it's more about the impact. So, you know, when we recorded this stuff, we did it old school way. We recorded on Pro Tools, but just basically using Pro Tools uh she just, just has a modern way of recording, but not taking advantage of any of what I would call studio trickery. You know, uh, the, the the drums are completely live drums recorded in a big room, and and uh, it's there's no amazing gear going on. You know, guitar tones are all got putting the mic in front of an amp, and there's no auto tune on the vocals. There's there's it's really just us working this together, and 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 coming from the same place of just loving those old records you know mainly from the 70s and that right. that true production you know and so now you're kind of taking the two of us in a studio doing this alone and putting it up against you know modern you know bands with proper budgets and you know uh and certain current sounds that you know come across a certain way and we're not we're not uh we're not there we're not doing that and and you know maybe that's uh, not the smartest thing or whatever, but I but I also believe that I want people to hear it and and hear the drums not sounding anything like modern drums. Right. And it's not like every band's doing this because there's there's plenty of bands, there's plenty of drummers out there that sound like themselves. You know there are, but the but the bulk of what goes on is 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 following a formula, <clears throat> and you know I but but it's not everybody, of course. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's uh. It's just, a, you know, to, that's just trying to back up, you know, if you're going to talk all this shit, you know, about, <laughs> oh, you know, this and that. And well, OK, what's your band sound like? You know, when you guys when you guys go to the studio, well, yeah, well, that's what we're going for. You know, the, the uh, yeah. So, so hopefully that sticks out. You know, we still, of course, want to be powerful and, and get get our point across in the production. But but yeah, there's no we're not uh, we're not playing the uh, current sort of paint, paint by numbers game in, in the world of studio recording, you know. Well, at least we've moved away from the 80s, uh, the thunderclap snare and the Simmons pads. <laughs> yeah, I, everybody got excited with, with Verb, and, and, and the guy that did it best was, was Phil Collins. You know, maybe maybe what they did, you know, with Power Station with Tony Thompson, that was pretty, that was groundbreaking sounding shit, you know. Mm -hmm. and uh, But, man, it got overblown. Like, we're just, you could have had a really ass kicking rock record and you decided to put insane amounts of verb on the snare and the whole mix and <laughs> it's kind of, it just it really it pinpoints it, it into a certain time and it 
yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, it's just, man, how I can only imagine like they just kept going more verb, more verb, right. more verb, more cowbell. <laughs> oh my, yeah, just like you know that, you know that would that's as funny of a joke as more cowbell. You know, it's even even funnier in some ways because <laughs> like you listen back, you're like, oh my god. That's a ton of shit going on, and it's it's almost like everybody put on when the levee breaks, right? It said, "God, those are the biggest drums." All right, well, there's a lot of reverb. Well, now we have killer amounts of reverb option in the studio. Just turn it all up, man. Let's get this going, you know? Right. But it wasn't. It had nothing to do with the fact that these were. This is like the world's most badass rock drummer in is a, a, tuning drums amazingly in a cool in a great room or a hallway or a stairwell with you know great engineers around it you know, it's you know they, they achieved something that was you know monumental at the time and still is you know it's, it's it, it, but you know you, you don't just turn a reverb and get that yeah which, <laughs> right exactly it's not a it's not an immediate fix for everything when we got this silver thorn thing going with with golden robot records it was like okay i have this minute, this much time before I'm in Japan for four months, and when I go there and dive into that world of learning, you know, over two hours of music, you know, that I, you know, I'm familiar with, and uh, but you know, I played, you know, I played on some of it because I've worked with the the, the Bees, that's the band here, uh, they're called Bees. I've recorded with them since 1999, so mm -hmm. it's not like I was going to a situation that I didn't know anything about. Uh, but I had to, you know, I had that hanging over my head. I have to show up in Japan ready to play all these songs. We're not going to be sitting around practicing parts. We are running songs. We're running the set the first rehearsal day, you know. So, so you know, and, and then with Silverthorn, okay, I have to get all this stuff set up before I get to Japan because as soon as I get there, we're going to two weeks of rehearsals and the tour starts. So my I'm going to be dedicated, you know, my mind's going to be there. I have to get this music locked into my head you know, ready to throw down without thinking live, you know, um, for the, for the next few months while I'm here. So now it's cool because we're touring and, you know, we're, we're more, we're closer to a machine now, you know, when you do a bunch of shows, you know, you yeah, know what you're doing, up, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, so, so when, you know, so yeah, like you said, the time, time will fly by. Yeah. You know, I have a family and stuff. So when I'm home, you know, we, 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 yeah, kids are in school, we, you know, I'm, you know, you're just doing all that stuff, so you know I'm not really paying attention to whatever everybody's everybody else is doing. You know, before you know it, six months goes by. Oh uh, yeah, very much so. The uh, well, I hope the uh, if Silverthorn comes through Tennessee, I'll keep an eye out for it and definitely try to make it out yeah. to one of the shows. I'll be looking forward to it. Yeah, so. I hope so. I, I hope uh, that you know that all that touring stuff will we're gonna. You were starting off slow, man. Just get get the name out there, get a song out, get the video out, build a following, see if people are into it. You know, see what options come our way and what we can develop. You know, and and so we're we're not expecting anything immediate. All you know, just we're we're totally ready to you know just just be smart about it and and try and have it grow. And, and see where it can go, you know, it, but without these expectations of, oh, the single's gonna come out and shoot to the top of the charts and we're gonna go out and tour with the biggest bands and, you know, I mean, it's, it's no, let's just, let's be realistic and, and see if we can sustain this, you know, that's the main thing is I want this to be our band and this is what we do and, and everything else I would do is outside and around this. This is the, this is, this is the center of my life musically and that's, you know, that's what I've always wanted. Yeah, it's been it's been a blast to play with like bands I grew up on and 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 you know have you know artists that you you know you bought their records as a kid and learn how to play drums from to hire you to be in that band and and you know that's so all great and play with you know you know, musicians I love and and you know legends so to speak or whatever but but you know as a kid I always just I just wanted my own rock band you know that's that's and uh. You know, so and I and I really do think I have it here. I I, I, I know what we can do. I know when I'm given the chance, what we're going to be able to uh, you know deliver. And uh, so I just want I just want that shot. Yeah, that's awesome. It sounds like you got a good thing going. And yeah, you've you've played with the best. So that's that's definitely bucket list items. But yeah, if you get this going and can have your own brand and and I hope it takes off for you because uh, I'll be looking forward to hearing the whole thing here shortly. I yeah. Hope. Yeah, it'll be real soon. You know, we just wanted to come out with that little little snippet. You know, just to show, the, the, you know, just just give you that that, that that little quick earshot of the production and you know a big riff into a you know Pete's vocals in the chorus. And, yeah. 
And uh, that's, you know, just give you that little taste. Like, and if, if, if something in there, you know, grabs you, awesome. You know, if it didn't grab you, chances are the full song isn't going to grab you either. You know yeah, no, I mean? it, was, so, it was a good so that, snippet. You know, you know, but that, that's that's how you do it. You know, just give somebody a little taste and go, cool, man. I hope I hear more and, and uh, you know, develop it from there. Definitely, definitely. Well, cool. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us, Brian. It's been an honor and good to uh, get your thoughts on things. And I'm always down to ramble on about Van Halen and stuff like that. So that's always fun for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. It's, it's, it's cool questions, man. You hit, it, like I said, you hit on some stuff. I'd be like, well, if that's all we had to talk about today, I'd be fine. You know? Right. Let's, let's talk about snare tones or yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's that's all good, man. Totally cool. Cool. Well, cool. We'll uh, we'll catch up again sometime, and I'll be looking out for Silverthorn. That's for sure. I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. All right, much. but good luck with the rest of the tour over there. Thank you. Hi. Right, bye. Okay. Bye.